our next talk comes from Egypt. Mohammed Ghanem is speaking to us. As we all, he had the liberty to select his own subject. Uh, <clears throat> I do thank the organizing committee for inviting me to share, to, to come to this meeting. <clears throat> I do come from Egypt, but not from Cairo. Cairo is an <clears throat> urban disaster. I come from a smaller town in the northeastern part of the Delta called Mansoura. Uh, literally, Mansoura, the translation of Mansoura is the victorious. <clears throat> And why it was named the Victorious? 800 years ago, the Crusaders decided to invade Egypt on their way to Jerusalem. So they assembled a big army from France, Germany, and England. What we call now the, the NATO. The NATO came to invade Egypt. <laughs> Uh, at that time, Egypt was strong. So we defeated the NATO and captured the commander-in-chief, King Louis IX. <clears throat> Where shall we put this important man? <clears throat> In Guantanamo or Abu Ghraib? But the Egyptians were not only strong, but they were civilized. <clears throat> so they put him in the house of the judge of Mansoura. <clears throat> Three months later, the Europeans paid the Egyptians a big ransom of money. But with time, the Egyptian civilization, civilization decayed, and we became a part of the so-called developing countries. And in developing countries, through the corruption and occupation by the French and English, the money went back to the European banks in secretive accounts. <clears throat> A small amount of money remained in Mansoura, with which we built the Urology and Nephrology Center. Uh, the, my, my talk is an, an assembly of all talks. Eh? It's an evolution of linear diversion and experience in our own institution. <clears throat> In 1984, we were visited by Professor Leonard Anderson, Professor of Urology at Karolinska. <clears throat> at the end of his visit, he was convinced that radical cystectomy with adequate lymphadenectomy could be carried out in men <clears throat> with little blood loss, and, and in women as well. This is act one in the story. The second act is that the Swedish Urological Association arranges for a yearly meeting. And they call it the Von Karl Garlis meeting in, to honor the first professor of urology in Sweden. <clears throat> so in 1985, they have invited Professor Don Skinner to come to carry out a live surgery, cystectomy, and continent cutaneous diversion. <clears throat> Dr. Skinner said, I apologize, I'm too busy. And he was astonished that they did not invite Professor Nils Cook a few miles to the south, and who is the father of continent cutaneous stomata. So and they invited Professor Cook to carry out the diversion. Who will carry the cystectomy? I think Leonard Anderson remembered me, and I was invited as well to carry out the cystectomy <coughs> and Professor Cook, the continent cutaneous diversion. I met with Professor Cook in the bar of the hotel on the night of surgery. And over a few scotches, I <coughs> suggested that why don't we get rid of the continent outlet and anastomose the and keep the anti-refluxing one, and anastomose the reservoir to the urethral stump. And I provided him with evidence next morning that 
we can carry out a cystectomy, radical, and we can <clears throat> uh, severe the, 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 the specimen below the apex of the prostate, keeping a, a reasonable stump through which the reservoir could be anastomosed. <clears throat> Professor Cook was invited to Mansoura, and the first Hemi Cook pouch was carried out in March 1986. It involved, as you know, isolation of 45 centimeters of terminal ileum with end-to-end -end anastomosis of the bowel. <clears throat> uh, Detubularization and 15 centimeters are utilized to construct the intersusception valve. Uh, this is a <clears throat> reconstructed CT scan of one of the patients treated by the heavy cook pouch. It shows the components of the operation, the kidneys, the ureter, the interception valve, and the body of the reservoir. <clears throat> when we completed 16 cases, I wrote a small draft and sent it to Professor Cook for his approval and revision. He phoned me back and told me, would you please remove my name from the authorship? I said, I told him, my uh, Professor Cook, he told me, I have not seen the results. I cannot put my integrity at stake. So I told him, why did you come to Mansoura and revise it? And he came to Mansoura with an independent, independent observer. And he, he was sure now that we were not bullshitting, and the results were okay. So we sent the paper to Journal of Urology, and it was accepted for, for publication with an editorial comment from the Don, Don Skinner. <clears throat> Don Skinner said, I question, I question the confidence of the authors in the degree of nocturnal incontinence. I await with considerable interest additional trials. Two years later, Professor, Cook, uh, Professor Skinner published his experience with the same operation, but with some modification in the name to be different. He said, he said Cook Ilia Reservoir with bilateral urethroilial urethrostomy instead of hemicook. And in the discussion, discussion, discussion section, he said, <clears throat> in my experience with retroiliorethrostomy, has become the procedure of choice for male patients after cystoprostatectomy. The initial question <clears throat> as to the significance of nocturnal uresis in uresis has become an issue. A, ve a very strong statement huh? that can only be said by the dawn. <clears throat> We have, in a subsequent paper, with a longer follow-up, with the same procedure, we commented that, we concluded that orthotopic substitution with the hemicox pouch is feasible with good functional outcomes. <clears throat> Nevertheless, an important number of complications are related to the construction of the nipple valve, which includes disassumption of the valve, stenosis of the valve, and formation of stones over the metallic staples. So the question was, <clears throat> can we devise an operation that can provide an anti-reflux mechanism and in the same time without valves or staples? <clears throat> so the idea of the serous line tunnel was born. <coughs> in this operation, we separate 40 centimeters from the <coughs> distal bowel, distal small intestine, arrange it, in, arrange it in a W, and the serosa of the two lateral limbs are joined together by a continuous suture of non-absorbable material. And when the anti-mesenteric border of the W is incised, then we have this situation. We have two troughs on either side of the new reservoir, serous line troughs. The ureters are laid in these two troughs. And when the mucosa on either sides 
are associated in front of the ureter, then we have uh, an anti-refluxing serous line ureteral implantation. The operation, this is a post-operative CT of a successful surgery, kidneys, ureters, new bladder, and an important segment of the ureters incorporated in the wall of the uh, new reservoir. <clears throat> in the late 90s, limitations of this operation is grossly dilated ureter. We cannot incorporate it in a serous line tunnel. Or the ureters are too short. And <clears throat> in the late 90s, an important change in the epidemiology of our cancer patient population had occurred. As a result of mass treatment of bilharziasis, the incidence of squamous carcinoma decreased substantially, while the incidence of transitional carcinoma increased significantly. For cystectomy for transitional cell carcinoma, the ureter cut at a higher level. And in addition, a segment from the cut head is sent for pathology. This usually results in, a, results in a shorter ureter, which sometimes made the serous land operation difficult or impossible. In 1996, Dr., the late Dr. Stein and his associate introduced an operation which is, in effect, a modification of the serous land tunnel. It's called the T pouch. In this operation, an additional segment of bowel is also made about 10, 12 to 15 centimeters. The body reservoir is arranged in a W. The additional segment is tailored. And in addition to the tailoring, mesenteric windows are created in the mesentery supplying this short segment. And when the segment, when the, and, and, and through the mesenteric holes, uh, <clears throat> nylon tape or whatever is introduced, and these holes will be utilized <clears throat> for fixation of the additional segment, the anti-refluxing segment within the body of the new reservoir as such. The four uh, mesenteric windows, and now <clears throat> this additional segment is placed between the two lateral limbs. <clears throat> and then non-absorbable suture are passed through the window, joining the serosa on either side. <clears throat> and then when these sutures are tied, then this segment is fixed within the body of the reservoir, and then the mucosa on either sides is sutured in front, creating a serous line tunnel in which a tailored iliar segment has been inserted. <clears throat> so this is the what you, the end of the thing, yeah? And then the two lateral edges are joined together to close the reservoir. <clears throat> uh, an IVP preoperative, postoperative, excellent functional outcome following the T pouch. <clears throat> A question was raised in the early 20s, is it an anti-refluxing mechanism important with low pressure reservoirs? I would refer to two trials, one of them in our department, comparing an anti-reflux system by a serous line tunnel, <coughs> comparing it uh, with a Studer operation. And another <coughs> uh, 
trial carried out in California, comparing Studer again with the tea pouch. In both trials, there was no difference between patients treated with Studer or with an anti-refluxing system. But yeah, always, with, and though the ureters in Studer are sutured in a direct fashion, but the operation itself incorporates an anti-refluxing mechanism of intermediate strength. The pressure created on the long afferent loop will create a force. The force equals pressure versus surface area and which acts as an anti-refluxing mechanism during straining to void. Later on, uh, Professor Houtman uh, modified this tutor. Instead of having one afferent limb, he made two horns on either side. I personally, um, I prefer this tutor because the long limb will provide a stronger force to act as an anti-refluxing system. Besides the right horn, the right horn on the right side <coughs> is anti-pristaltic. Pristaltic. It may, it may result in a f some form of functional obstruction. Anyway, some requirements are needed for a successful direct anastomosis, normal upper tract, low pressure reservoir during voiding phase, no or minimal residual urine. The urine is sterile or rendered sterile. Continent containers diversion, what we use is in effect a double T pouch. One limb to provide <coughs> anti-reflux, and this is important in this situation. And the other limb to provide the continent outlet. Like this one, okay. And we prefer to bring the continent outlet at the umbilical stoma. At the end of the operation, we test the competence of the outlet introduce a catheter into the outlet limb, inject air, and then remove the catheter and test the thing. Yeah? In this case, yeah, it was okay. And then we put the catheter again and the pouch deflates. And we bring it through the continent stone. Professor Mandy says, or believes, in a comment when we presented this operation in one of the British meetings, God did not create the umbilicus so as urine may come throughout, throughout the umbilicus. So I asked him why God then had created the umbilicus. He said, so as we can sip champagne from it. orthotopic bladder substitution in women, the most important initial observation is that the patients did not void to completion. Sometimes you call it overcontinence or important amount of residual urine. Uh, this is a voiding thing in one of the patients. And we have, we believe that the overcontinence is not due to <clears throat> neurological or whatever, it is due to that, the fact that the pouch descends uh, behind the urethroiliel <clears throat> anastomosis leading to a functional obstruction. So to overcome this one, we anastomose the, we get the two round ligaments, attach them to the, and the, to the corners of the vaginal stump, and in addition, we put a large mental flap into the pelvis to, to fill the pelvis and to provide a back support to the new bladder. And this is what video, uh, video uh, cystography of one of the patients treated in this manner. As they strain, there is no descent, and the patient can void to completion. Okay, I'm about to finish. Uh, orthotopic radical stectomy and orthotopic bladder substitution 
will take in our hands five to six hours. So on the night of the, before the operation, you have to sleep, to sleep alone or with your wife, essentially similar. <laughs> and then you go, go back home and you are tired. So again, you sleep uh, with your wife, you know, without doing any functional activity. So if you do carry out two or three cases every week, then you expect a paper asking for divorce. So take, uh, at the end of every AUA, uh, they give you the so-called takeaway message. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I give you the takeaway take seven pillars of wisdom. Integrity, accurate reporting is important. Second, always be criticize yourself, self-criticism, ability to demify and change. Huh? Without keeping your name you know, on an operation and then you defend it in spite of the fact that it has drawbacks. Mm. Be aware, we, we should be aware, the young generation should be aware of important developments in science that will have reflections on urology and other old disciplines in medicine, namely nanotechnology and biotechnology. Do not overwork. Overworking is useless, it's shit. You should have time to think and meditate. Improve your culture. It's not only urology. Urology is, <clears throat> is something in the vertical direction, but horizontally, you should improve your culture. Reading books of different types, travel, music, making friends from other professions, not from doctors. Play sports regularly. And, and important to have a, st a stable home front. I cannot go back home after a seven hour operation and have a fight. This will be difficult. Uh, I thank you very much for your kind attention. Everything is clear. I think there are no questions, huh? right? Well. Do we have questions, comments? Yeah, please, go ahead. The anti-reflux... My, my hearing is poor. The anti-reflux plastic in adult kidney doesn't affect it, the kidney if there's reflux still. That is our experience. We examine... 200 patients after kidney transplantation, 82% has a reflux, despite they, t they took uh, immune suppressiva, they have pyronephritis. The reflux in adolescent kidney doesn't affect the kidney. That is, what's your opinion? Uh, we carry out transplants as well, but we, uh, we think this is uh, renal transplantation is a very precious gift. In our hands, uh, in our opinion, we protect it. We carry out a small operation, thin. We take 10 minutes more, Lish Gregoire operation. For, uh, it's easy, and we do it. As far as uh, low pressure reservoirs, in our department, some now, <laughs> We are in a democratic country after the revolution. So somebody will carry an anti-reflux, somebody will carry a tea, some, somebody else will do nothing, etc. So I, I believe in anti-reflux, yeah. Okay. I may be wrong. I think I'm wrong. <laughs> Dr. Ghanayim, thank you for uh this wonderful talk and all of the amazing contributions you've made in your career. Thank you. I have a specific question in regards to the T-valve. So 
After we initially started uh, with the experience out of USC with the T-valve as an anti-reflux, many things that we make, while it initially looked good, while it, oh, over here, Dr. Ganaim. <laughs> So while the initial uh, results with the anti-refluxing T-valve appeared good, with time we realized that even that valve can stenose. And we began to see patients showing up in renal failure because of stenosis of the T-limb. I'm curious what your experience has been with stenosis of that valve and what you needed to do in order to fix it. Stenosis of the T valve. If the if there are no recurrence, huh, and you think that the longevity of the patient is uh, most probable, you take it out and convert it to a suder. What happened? Make another small limb and put a suder thing in it. My, you do that? Well, uh, so uh, the few that I've actually seen, if we could not fix them endoscopically, essentially the big dilated extra, uh, um, extra pouch portion of the T limb as it became very dilated, proximal to the obstruction, uh, I began to just incise that and open the pouch and essentially marsupialize the valve right into the pouch itself. It essentially bypassed the, uh, the anti-reflux uh, and it, 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 there was no need for additional bowel to be cut. Uh, you are the expert in tea. You are the student <laughs> from uh, Skinner and Stein, etc. So, But if we do that, we do a suder. Uh, thank now you for your presentation. And last question. I would, want, I would like to ask about uh, I saw that you didn't talk about intermittent self catheterization after your uh, new bladder repair and uh, by putting the omentum. Right. Yes, uh, what, what I wanted to find out is do you get the same results as complete emptying on the bladder in both male and female? Intermittent castorization is used ob obviously in continent continuous diversion. And uh, that's why <clears throat> it is important to have an anti refluxing system because these bowels are infected 100%. Uh, for uh, orthotopic substitution, uh, in women, I think we make a revision all the time to provide back support of the new bladder because intermittent catheterization in women is difficult, it's disastrous, it's difficult. Yes, I'm talking about in men because men have, you know, have very long urethra. Do you have the same results as compared to women because with a short urethra female, they may be able to do that, but in men, do you advise uh, on intermittent self characterization? I cannot hear the question now. Perhaps this is something that you could talk about afterwards to Professor Gonheim. In men, yeah, intermittent castration with orthotopic substitution? Yeah, when men self catheterize, do they have the same result and then those children? Oh, you can do that if they cannot void to completion, but I wonder that if there's a stenosis and a, uh, an astomosis or a stricture in the urethra or whatever, I don't know. I, I cannot tell you what other than intermittent castration. Okay. I, I, I think I, I, I'm finished. <laughs>